Tonight's talk has two titles, uh, Can Faith Without Love Save? or Why Faith Alone Fails? Now, you're probably wondering, this is an obvious topic. I, I really don't need to hear this. We all know that in order to be saved, to be justified, to go to heaven, I need to be a person of love. You know, I've got to love God, I've got to love Jesus, I've got to love the church, I've got to love my neighbour. So what's the big deal here? Why do we have to hear this talk about something which is so obvious? Because for certain people in the past and in the present here in Sydney, it is not so obvious. And I'm going to outline what these certain people have taught in the past, in the distant past and in recent days so to speak. Now we all know about Martin Luther, the official recognised founder of the Protestant Reformation. And if commonly we would track the faith, belief in faith alone for justification and salvation is normally traced back to him. So let's look at a couple of quotes from Martin Luther as a start up. Luther wrote, quote, Faith is the principal point and the highest commandment, which includes all others in itself. Let's look at this briefly. Faith is the principal point, meaning it's the first necessary thing we must do in order to be saved. And the highest commandment, it's what is most expected of us by God. The first and most important thing Christians should do, which includes all others in itself. We'll, come, we'll look at that last point later, but just keep in your mind, Luther himself in this quote says that faith, paraphrasing, is the first and most important thing Christians should do in order to be saved. Elsewhere he said, quote, rather, faith shall be the master over love, and love shall yield to it. Okay? So faith, paraphrasing here Luther, is more important than love. It is the master over love. You're probably thinking, how could Luther say that? Well, Luther said many things. His works are voluminous. Many things we would agree with. He's not the most radical of the Protestant reformers. Some came after him rejecting more of the Catholic faith than him. But he said certainly enough that we have to disagree with. He also said the following. This indicates uh, Luther's own opinion of himself, sadly. Quote, There is no man living on earth who knows how to distinguish between the law and the gospel. Even the man Jesus Christ was so wanting in understanding when he was in the vineyard, that is the Garden of Gethsemane, that an angel had to console him. Though he was a doctor from heaven, he was strengthened by an angel. You're probably, what's he saying here? It's confusing. He's, what he's trying to say here is that only Dr. Luther has clearly understood what the true gospel is. Of course, in opposition to Catholicism, to popery, etc., and then he makes this comment about Jesus, I don't know why. But I'll give you this other quote about Jesus from a more contemporary, radical, anti-Catholic apologist in the United States who's very well known. He's debated every reputable Catholic apologist in the States. He came out here to Australia in 2009. This fellow named James White wrote in his work, The Catholic Controversy, The Roman Catholic Controversy in 1996, quote, but he, that is Jesus, Jesus did not deem it proper to discuss the specifics of the issues prior to Calvary. In his sovereign will, he left that to the Apostle Paul. Left what? James White says here something probably a little bit more shocking than what Luther, I just quoted from Luther. James White says that Jesus really didn't tell us anything, didn't teach us anything about what we must do to be saved. He left that to St. Paul. And hence you get people like James White, who's a mixture of Baptist, Evangelical Baptist and Presbyterian Calvinist beliefs. 
and many like him in the fundamentalist evangelical camp who look to St Paul and St Paul exclusively to determine what we must do to be saved and to draw from St Paul their faith alone doctrine, justification by faith alone. We're going to have a look later specifically at what Jesus does say and see clearly that he says many things about what we must do to be saved. Now, closer to home, here in Sydney, I'm now going to give you a quote from a Sydney Anglican minister who I know personally. We shared working in chaplaincy at Sydney University uh, a few years back. I started there in 2002. I did four years full-time at Catholic chaplaincy at Sydney University, two years part-time. This gentleman, Reverend Andrew Cate was one of the main Anglican chaplains on campus at that time. Well, he was there before me and after me. He spent many more years there than I did. But he's now, I think, a minister at a parish in Croydon here in inner western Sydney. And I, I mention his name deliberately because he's gone out publicly with this quote. He's got his own website, his own blog site and he's put this comment into the public realm for all to read and he says the following and I think this sets us up for why we need to have a talk like this quote Roman Catholic doctrine is that we are justified by faith and love make sure you hear this as my theology lecturer at Moore College stressed Roman Catholicism is not rankly Pelagian. <clears throat> Let's have a stop there. What is Pelagian? <coughs> it's a heresy from the 5th century that says that you can work your way into heaven. You, it's a justification by works, work salvation. That you alone only need to look at Jesus as the example, the exemplar, follow that example, through your own efforts, your own good works, and you can be saved. Okay, back to the quote. Catholicism knows better than to say we simply earn our salvation. It is more subtle and more dangerous than that. It holds that salvation is by grace, but that what unites us to the grace of Christ is not bare faith, but faith plus love. In this, as in so many things, Augustine is their teacher. Note, the Catholic Church teaches we need to have faith and love to be saved, and St. Augustine is the source of this teaching for Catholics. Quote again, it was precisely this that the Reformers objected to. The reason is, of course, that faith plus love gives us a boast before God. We can point to something worthy about ourselves, our love. If you're stunned about this quote, I understand. We need to unpack it and respond to it point by point. Now, when Andrew Cate says that having, insisting on love in addition to faith gives us something to boast about, what is Andrew Cate referring to? Well, he's referring to Ephesians, St. Paul in Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 8 to 9 and 10. Normally they just quote verses 8 and 9. I'm going to read you this quote. At the end of this talk, I will return to this quote and I'll outline the Catholic understanding of Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. This is the quote. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God not the result of works so that no one may boast for we are what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life so Andrew Cate, like so many evangelicals, sees on this quote to assert, see, the gospel of salvation is salvation by faith alone. 
not works. If we insist on works in addition to faith, we're insisting on something from ourselves that we can boast about. So anything in addition to faith from our part is a work, and that includes love. It's a human work not necessary for justification and salvation. I'm still confused at this point, though. Why faith is okay and love is not okay? Why love is reduced to a human work and yet the faith that we respond with is not a human work? But I'll answer that later on. Andrew Cade goes on to say the following. Looking at John 3.14 now. Remember the term I introduced earlier from him? All we need is faith. He says, bear faith. That's all you need, bear faith to be saved. He goes on to say, the key text is John 3.14. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So imagine, just Jesus lifted up on the cross. All we need to do is look at Jesus on the cross point our heads in that direction and believe in what he did for us on the cross. That's bare faith. That's all we need to be saved. Furthermore, he says, faith here is depicted not as a thing, but you might say as a vector, the vector looking towards Jesus on the cross. Not a real quality in me, but merely the direction of my gaze towards Christ, like Israel in the wilderness, looking towards that bronze servant on the pole that Moses erected. Bare faith. If you ever ask the question, why isn't faith a work? You'll know something like this is the only answer. Okay, so summing up here, Luther knew what the gospel was, no one else did. Jesus was susceptible to confusion even, according to Luther. James White tells us, Jesus didn't tell us anything specific about what we must do to be saved. It was St. Paul. And looking at St. Paul, one quote from St. Paul, Andrew Cade says, it's clear, all we need for salvation is bare faith, bare vector faith. And the Catholics, in insisting on love, in addition to faith, are introducing a human element in addition to Christ's work. They're introducing human works that they can boast of in addition to faith. And this is what the reformers objected to. Okay, the Catholic faith, sorry, the Catholic response. Let's look at the definition of faith first, looking at scripture. What is faith? Is faith really a, a look, a direction towards Christ? Does scripture tell us that or is it something more? We've got to be careful not to limit faith by, by definition and not to exaggerate its definition either. Because as we'll see later, there is a tendency by some who feel that we need to have love in addition to faith, incorporate love into the meaning of faith. But we'll, again, we'll see that later. Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 6 says the following. Now, quote, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. So according to the author of Hebrews, faith is believing in something that we hope for, but we can't see yet. I can't see God, but I believe in him on someone else's authority. That's faith. I do, I've never seen Jesus. I've never seen him rise from the dead but I believe that he's risen from the dead on someone else's authority. Now, for Catholics, faith, that act of believing in something, even though I can't see it, believing in something I hope for in the future, even though I don't have it yet, that is an act of my intellect, moved by my will, under the influence of grace. That's how St Thomas Aquinas would put it. It's not... It, it's not including yet, it won't include hope, that is trust in God, trust in Christ, and love. They will come. They must flow. 
But this is what faith is. Some people say, look, the Catholic definition of faith is depraved. It's only an intellectual thing. No, you got to... This is another argument from another direction. The, cap, the real definition of faith includes hope and love, trust and love. Actually, no, no, no. The true definition of faith is what I just read from Hebrews 11. Now, the Catholics don't just stop at that definition of faith and to have that faith in order to be saved. Of course we insist on trust and love, but not within the definition of faith, but as under the definitions of hope and love. And again, we'll look at St. Paul here to help us identify that. Also, let's look at John 3 again. Remember, and Andrew Cate quoted John 3, 14 to help with his definition of faith as being merely a bare faith vector. John 3, 36 says the following. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Belief, that's equivalent to faith. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides in him. So on the one side, the good person is he who believes in Christ. That's the person who will be saved. The person who will not be saved is that person who does not obey. Hold on. Shouldn't it be on one side, the person who believes will be saved and the person who does not believe will not be saved? No, because for St. John, belief in Christ is also pregnant with obedience to Christ. Let's get this con correct here. If I believe in Jesus as my, as my Lord, personal Lord, Lord of the whole world, as my Saviour, personal Saviour, Saviour of the whole world, if I accept Jesus as Lord, I believe he's Lord, what must necessarily flow from that? I must obey the Lord. So it's quite clear here in John 3.36 that belief also incorporates obedience. How could I say, I believe in you, Lord, but I don't obey you? I believe in you, Lord, but I do not love you. I believe you're the son of God. You rose from the dead. You ascended into heaven. You're my saviour, but I don't love you. I, don't, I won't obey you. I don't need to obey you because all I need is bare vector faith. As you can see, it's, it's not working. Faith alone as a bare vector direction, a look, a glance, a gaze cannot work. Now, why do you think there is this insistence on justification by faith alone. It's very theological, but I'll give you a basic understanding of it. I, I knew another fellow, uh, another Anglican minister who engaged in a debate back in 1996, a public debate with Patrick Madrid, the Catholic apologist who visited Australia in June 96, who's coming out again this May. Martin Ford now resides in Perth, and he's the son of a former Anglican bishop, and sadly he's ferociously anti-Catholic. Okay, his literature is all on the website for anyone to read. And I took this quote from an article of his on that website, Is the Reformation Over, written in 2006. And he says the following, quote, If I deny that salvation is received by faith alone, I'm denying the death, that Christ's death was complete. As I have already noted, to deny the completeness of Christ's death is to deny the very gospel itself quoting Galatians 2.21. In other words, faith alone safeguards the more important idea of Christ alone. How does that work? This is how it works for them. They look at Christ's death on the cross differently to Catholics. They look at Christ's death on the cross under a heading called penal substitution. Jesus was a substitute for us who took the penalty for us. Jesus was punish in our place. You probably think, oh, that's true. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. That's what I've always believed. Okay. Jesus was a penal substitute dying in our place. He took the punishment. So Jesus willingly accepting to take the punishment due from God for sin on our behalf. He's taken all the punishment. And for anyone who believes in Jesus would no longer hangs under the threat of punishment. There's no more punishment for that person 
who has accepted what Jesus has done on the cross for them. Because Jesus has done under, received, taken all the punishment that's due for sin. Nice and neat. So if I believe I have to do something in addition to believing in Christ's cross, I'm adding something extra to what Jesus did. And there's the blasphemy. I'm believing that Jesus' cross was therefore insufficient if I believe I have to do something than, more than just believe, have faith in what he did for us on the cross. That's how they look at it. Now, there are verses that tend to support the idea of Jesus being a penal substitute. Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. And I could quote some other verses as well. Galatians 3.13, 1 Peter 3.18, 2 Corinthians 5.21, 1 Peter 2.24, where it, it, it says, Christ bore our sins in his body. So again, to be honest here, these verses tend to support the view that Jesus was a penal substitute. But is that really the correct view? Is that really all Jesus was on the cross? a substitute on our behalf who took the punishment due to us himself. Now that's wholly insufficient. Let's look at one negative reason, one positive reason why that's incorrect. What was the true punishment due to sin? Due to mortal sin, due to the sin of, of our original parents, Adam and Eve. It wasn't simply physical punishment and it wasn't simply death. It was more than that. The punishment due to mortal sin was eternal damnation. So if Jesus was truly a penal substitute, he would have taken on all the punishment that was due for mortal sin, for original sin and our sins. Physical abuse, death and eternal damnation. Did Jesus undergo eternal damnation? As a Catholic, I would say no. But in response, someone would say to me, how could you say no? Look at your own creed. Look at the Apostles' Creed. He descended into hell. So, you're wrong, Robert. Jesus was punished, did die, and went to hell. You see, he fully took on all the punishment due to sin. The Greek word originally in the creed is Hades. Keep that in mind. And hence, what is the Catholic response? Right, Jesus did go to Hades, but he didn't go to the hell of the damned. He didn't go to the fiery place of the damned. Because Hades meant, in a general term, for the underworld. The fiery place of the damned was a part of Hades. It was Gehenna, where the damned were suffering. But Jesus didn't go to that part of Hades. He went to that part called Abraham's bosom, the limbo of the patriarchs. We read 1 Peter 3.19, he went, to, he descended to, the, to preach to those souls that were in prison. Remember Jesus on the cross, he said to the good thief, today you shall be with me in paradise. If Jesus went to the hell of the damned, he couldn't have said that. He went down, he didn't go to heaven, that wasn't heaven, that paradise. Jesus descended to Abraham's bosom, the place where every just person from Adam and Eve onwards were waiting <coughs> before they could go to heaven. Because no one could go to heaven before Jesus, the Messiah, as the one eternal high priest, opens the gates of heaven and ascends through those gates on Ascension Thursday. No one could go into heaven before Jesus. So Jesus goes down to Abraham's bosom, the limbo of the patriarchs, to tell those good people the good news. And his presence down there made it paradise. And that's where the good thief went as well, to that place. And after he preached, we know he rose from the dead. 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. All those souls came out of Abraham's bosom and followed Jesus, the high priest, into the heavenly temple. So Jesus did not go to the hell of the damned. So he's not strictly a penal substitute. How then should we look at what Jesus did for us on the cross. 
Starting point again is St. Paul and Philippians 2, 5 to 8. This is what's called the famous kenosis passage in Greek. He lowered himself. What we, the way we look at what Jesus did on the cross is to understand firstly what Adam did and to see exactly how Jesus reversed that. Adam sought to be like God in knowledge. He disobeyed, he, he, was, he became proud, sorry, he, his pride was inflamed, you could be like God in knowledge, knowing good and evil. His pride was inflamed, he accepted the lie from the serpent that in fact God was the liar, he believed he could be like God, exalted like God in knowledge, and he disobeyed. The new Adam, to repair the damage caused by the old Adam, had to do an act of reparation that completely reversed what Adam did, the first Adam did. While Adam was man who sought to be like God, Jesus was God who became man. While Adam, he's, he was inflamed in pride, Jesus humbled himself. While Adam disobeyed, Jesus obeyed. So we can see the complete opposite. Adam tended to, Adam brought us down through pride and disobedience. Jesus raises us up through humility and obedience. What Jesus does on the cross, he is a substitute. But he's not a penal substitute, he's a sacrificial substitute. Adam's original sin was a mortal sin that caused death to him spiritually and Eve, but offended God infinitely. In magnitude, it was an infinite offence. Why? You measure the magnitude of the offence in relation to the dignity of the person who's offended. The dignity of the person being offended is God, who's almighty and infinite. Therefore, that sin committed by our original parents was of infinite magnitude, infinite degree. The reparation needed to come for that sin from humanity. But humanity being a creature cannot do an act of infinite merit, infinite reparation. So this is where we were stuck. This is the bind we were in. Legally, we caught what we deserved. We could not pay off the debt that we owed because we could not do an act of infinite reparation. Hence, we're stuck. God supplies the solution. Unmerited grace, the gift of Jesus Christ, who, being God, lowers himself, becomes man, takes the form of a servant, takes the form of a slave, becomes one of us. And as true man, being a son of Adam, through Mary, he can represent us on the cross, and being true God, that sacrifice, that self-sacrifice of himself on the cross offered to the Father can be of infinite value because Jesus is one person, a divine person, who owns that human nature that is being sacrificed, who owns that human will that submits to the Father in Gethsemane. And so that, the value of that sacrifice in the eyes of the Father is infinite. That's why Jesus is the only redeemer, the one mediator, and the only person who could be the, the Lamb of God that offers his sacrifice on our behalf, because only he is true God and true man at the same time. He is a substitute, but not a penal substitute. He's a sacrificial substitute. He is, as scripture tells us, the Lamb of God. When Jesus makes his appearance, there's St. John the Baptist. You read in the Gospel of St. John, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb is offered as unblemished sacrifice in atonement for sin. And Jesus is that unblemished sacrifice to the, in, to the Father on our behalf in atonement for sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, St. Paul says, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, you see, within this sacrifice, 
There is punishment. There is death. And this is what Jesus has to accept, the will of the Father. Adam sought to be exalted, exalt himself. In reparation, we must be humbled, humi humiliated. And so Jesus knew Adam must accept death and humiliation. So there is punishment involved, but it, Jesus is not simply being a substitute to take on punishment, but he's then in the midst of this punishment, he's willingly offering it to the Father on our behalf. So he's a sacrificial substitute. And hence, in imitation of Christ, we must be like him. See, this is the point. The true Christian life is to have faith in Christ and to obey Christ and to love Christ and to imitate Christ. Christ is the exemplar. He sets the example. A life of self-sacrifice, a life of love and a life of obedience. This is how we must live. So, and look at, let's look at the scriptures again. Matthew 10, 38. Christians are called to live like Christ. Quote, take up your cross and follow me. Romans 12, 1. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Philippians 4, 18. Almsgiving is a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Philippians 2.17, martyrdom, quote, is being poured as a libation. That's a sacrifice. Hebrews 13.16, praise, quote, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, when we are doing fasting and almsgiving, and offering up other sacrifices. Are we attempting to do something in addition to Christ's cross in order to be saved? You Catholics are foolish. All you need is bare vector faith. You don't need to do these other works attempting to add to what Christ did on the cross. Sorry, that's not how it is. What we're doing in obedience to Christ and out of love of Christ is imitating Christ. We are living a life of self-sacrifice, firstly to conquer our own wayward, disordered passions, appetites and emotions, etc. To get them regulated and integrated again. But we're offering these sacrifices not in addition to Christ, but in union with his sacrifice. Together with him. So is it really faith alone without love that saves? Let's look at some more scripture quotes. The idea that faith and love are contrary to the gospel is so hideous that it's a wonder these people can talk, that anyone can assert that in all honesty. Let's look now at John 5, 39 to 47. Jesus says the following. Quote, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. <coughs> come to me. The first thing Jesus says there, you must come to me. That's more than just bare vector faith, a direction, looking, gazing and believing. We must Come to him. That's one extra step. Jesus goes on to say, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, and you do not have the love of God in yourselves. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So Jesus is condemning these people. I think they're Pharisees and scribes. Because of two reasons. One, they don't come to him and they do not have the love of God in their hearts. That's a the problem. They lack both faith, obedience, because come to him means to obey him, and love. Then we have more. Remember our friend James White. Jesus didn't say anything important about this question. He left it to St. Paul. The question about what I must do to be saved. Let's look at the Gospels. 
Luke 10, 25 to 28. We have a young lawyer appears before Jesus and asks him the following question. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There it is. There's the question. We've been debating this for 500 years. In five years, we're going to have the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and all this will be raised up again. But the question was asked in the Gospel. It's recorded there. And unlike what James White asserts, Jesus gives an answer. I could have abbreviated this talk into two minutes. Just read this question and the answer. Settled. What does Jesus say? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He, that is the lawyer, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. There's the answer. You want eternal life? Hear Jesus. Listen to him. Obey him. What does he command? Obey the commandments. Your your life is meant to be a life of love. Now listen here. I need to listen. I need to remind myself every time. When I talk about love, I've got to look at myself in the mirror and see if there's any love there. Okay? I have to, I'm always careful when I talk about love. But the fact is, the Lord Jesus, who we have to have faith in and must obey, commands love. The two tablets of the law, love God, love neighbour. St Paul sums up the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. It's like a tree. Faith, hope and love are like a tree. Imagine a tree, what does it need to be fruitful? needs the roots firmly established in the ground. That's faith. It needs a strong trunk and strong branches. That's hope. Trusting in God to give us everything we need to be saved. And it needs to bear fruit. What is the fruit? Love, charity. Jesus comes up to a tree on the side of the road. A fig tree, what does he see on the fig tree? It had roots, it had leaves, it had a trunk, it had branches. What didn't it have? fruit. It had no fruit. What did Jesus do? Cursed it. It died. You can't be saved just having faith, just having faith and hope. It must be faith, hope and love. The same question, a similar question is asked of Jesus recorded in Mark 12, 28 to 34. Jesus answers that he is to love the Lord with all your heart mind and strength and to love his neighbour as himself. Same type of question, a lawyer, same type of answer. Love. The teacher of the law agrees with Jesus and adds that obeying these two commands is, quote, better than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus agrees with him and says, quote, you are not far from the kingdom of God. This uh, student of the law, he understood the need, the critical need for love, not just going through the motions and obeying the technicalities of the law. Now, some people, genuine people, good people, who believe in faith alone, feel the weight of these arguments and the weight of these scripture verses and the statements of Jesus. And so they say to themselves, look, we, it's, it's, it's faith alone, but faith means, includes trust and love. Remember I said that before. So they argue this line, faith alone but never alone. Sounds contradictory. I assert it is contradictory. Faith alone but never alone is therefore not alone. Okay? (laughs) As simple as that. I know it's funny, when you're talking with people, very good people, good-willed people, you know, don't laugh at them because it doesn't help. (laughs) Okay? It's not charitable and it doesn't help. Remember, don't make the mistake I made for many years. It's not about winning the argument. It's about winning the person. And I spent 15 years winning arguments. 
I've never lost an argument, to be frank, but that's because the Catholic faith has all the answers. Not all, I don't have all the answers. The Catholic faith has all the answers. But I didn't win many people for many years. I won nobody for 15 years. I've been involved in quite a few conversions lately. It's God who converts, not me, not us. But I've been involved in a large number of conversions over the last 10 years only because I got that out of my system, out of my conversation, out of my demeanour. You know, you don't criticise, you don't attack, you don't lose your temper, you don't get stroppy, you don't laugh at them. Because you want to win them and you can only win them if you befriend them. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now back on this point, is, is faith, does faith include hope and love? This is what I call accordion theology, squeezing it all into one narrow word. It doesn't. St Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So faith, hope, love, abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. It's very clear that faith, hope and love for St Paul are three, they're distinct and despite what Martin Luther says, the greatest commandment is not faith. According to St Paul, the greatest of these is love. It's emphatic, it's clear. Then St Paul says the following, 1 Corinthians 13, 2. This is before, in the same chapter. You hear this quoted in many weddings. A lot of couples choose 1 Corinthians 13 because it's about love, okay? And St Paul says here, now listen to these words. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but I do not have love, I am, who knows it? I am nothing. nothing. Very good. Excellent. So, how can we be saved by faith alone? If I have all faith and I do not love, I am nothing. Nothing. Faith alone fails. Paul again, Galatians 5, 6. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. But faith working through love. Like that tree, rooted in the ground firmly, strong trunk and branches bearing that fruit of charity. So what if I believe in God, and I believe in Jesus, and I trust in Jesus, if I'm a nasty man? And I can be nasty. I've got to watch out. I can't say, you know, I'm going to heaven for sure. I'm saved because I have faith. I trust in Jesus' work on the cross. That's it. I'm a blood-bought, Bible-believing Christian. I've got to work at it daily. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. St. Paul. That's it. Conclusion. Let's go back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to 10. Give it an explanation. For by grace... Grace, you have been saved through faith. We certainly have. We've been saved by through Jesus. That's the grace. That's the gift, unmerited. Without Jesus being true God and true man to offer that sacrifice on our behalf on the cross, we could not have been redeemed. And how are we personally saved? Jesus' death on the cross is the objective redemption for all of humanity. But how am I subjectively, personally saved through faith? I believe in Jesus. I believe you're the Son of God who's died for me on the cross, who's risen from the dead, who's ascended into heaven. I believe. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. That's right. It's all a gift. Jesus coming is the gift. Jesus on the cross is the gift. My faith, even my, that I, my response, is also a, a response to a gift, grace, prevenient grace, Actual graces, enlightening me, moving my will. When I say yes to Jesus, yes to God, that is also, it is my yes, it is my faith, but it's in response to God's grace. He really owns it. Then he rewards me for doing something that he owns, that he inspired in me, but it's still coming from me, but in response to his prevenient grace. Not the result of works, so that no man may boast. That's right. All this is the work of God. We did not save ourselves. 
We could not save ourselves. We could not have died on the cross ourselves and offer that up to the Father. We could not have had faith without God's grace. That's why we can't boast, because it's God who redeemed the world, not anything we did, and even our own faith is in response to God's grace. For we are what we have been made, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Now let's sum it up. We enter the new and everlasting covenant of Jesus Christ. You know those words, this is a new and everlasting covenant. We hear them at mass. We enter that through faith and baptism. That's in obedience to Christ. Go baptize all nations. We enter into that. We believe, we believe Jesus was our sacrificial substitute, dying on our behalf as the paschal lamb. And now I must obey and now I must sacrifice in union with him. So I must do what Jesus commands. Now that I'm in Christ Jesus through faith and baptism, I must obey, I must do what he commands. He commands baptism. He commands obey the commandments. He commands love of God, love of neighbour. So I, once I'm in the new and everlasting covenant, I'm obliged to walk with Jesus, to walk alongside him, to imitate him, to obey him, to love him. And I'm, so I'm created for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the way of life of Christians. Now, one response is, is that, see, we're saved for works, not by works. It's not Catholic teaching that we're saved by works. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. I don't look at works as something I have to pile up, like bricks. I must get a number of, this pile must get to a certain height for me to be saved. Because that would be buying my way into heaven. I must, whatever I do, loving God, loving neighbour, it's charity. Remember, Mother Teresa teaches us, it's the little things that count. Not the big things, it's the amount of love that we have in doing those little things. That's what counts. I've already told you, faith alone but never alone is contradictory. It doesn't make sense. It's, a, it's an attempt to try and you know, say yes, acknowledge that we really do need more than actual belief. And therefore if we do more, need more than belief, hope and love, then it's not alone. Let's finish with two quotes. Matthew 19, 17. If you wish to enter into life, Jesus saying this, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments, meaning live a life of love of God above all things and your neighbour as yourself out of love of God. And just to finish off, to show that we, St Paul certainly taught that we need faith and love, Ephesians 6.23. Quote, peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love undying. Thank you. Thank you for purchasing this presentation produced by Arts Media Productions. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation and share it with your family and friends. May God richly bless you.